Shades of Entrepreneurship, where we interview entrepreneurs to inspire the future entrepreneur. I'll be your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. So grab a drink, sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Guest is a creator, strategist, and speaker, and he helps insurance professionals create meaningful and sustainable long term growth in their careers and businesses. Please welcome the founder and president of Road Risk, Ryan Hanley. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, I'm here with Ryan Hanley of Road Risk. Ryan, how are we doing? Oh, it's my pleasure to be here, man. We're, we're doing great. It's a Beautiful day in upstate New York, so uh, we don't get many of those, so we, yes. uh, we take advantage of them when we can. Yes, I was actually telling Ryan right before I got on the show of how this podcast kind of started is up in Syracuse, up in upstate, a little bit north Syracuse, uh, or New York, I would say. But yes, yeah. they're uh, very seldom um, really, you know, really pretty sunny days around that area. Yeah. So um, I went to school at the University of Rochester, so about an hour west of Syracuse, and I live in the greater Albany area, so about a two and a half hours from Syracuse. And uh, I think I think in Albany, we get 66 days of sun a year. Uh, in Syracuse, they get like 62. And in Rochester, I think it's under 60 days of sun a year. It's crazy. Now, folks that listening, I want you to understand this is days, not percentage of the yeah. days. This is yeah, yeah. individual days, days of like, sun. Yeah, like it's two crazy. months of sun. <laughs> like, that's yeah, that's why everyone's it. a little ornery up here when you come. You know, what I mean, <laughs> very nice people, hardworking, blue collar. You know, I, I enjoy being from upstate New York, but everybody's got a little bit of orneriness in them, and it's just that uh, that vitamin D deficiency. You know, so. hey, I didn't say it. I didn't say it. <laughs> All right. So Ryan, go ahead and introduce, could you please uh, introduce yourself and share a bit about your educational background, career journey, and any personal experience that helped shape your entrepreneurial journey? Yeah. Uh, so I'll take people just back a, li- a little bit, um, only because I think it gives context to how I got to be what I am today, which is the CEO and founder of a national digital kind of commercial insurance agency called Rogue Risk. Um, I went to the University of Rochester, as I said, was a math major, mostly because I flunked out of engineering school and (laughs) uh, tried a whole bunch of like crappy, big jobs, American Express. I worked for an accounting firm and, um, you know, the companies I'm sure are fine, but my role in them was terrible and uh, hated it. Um, Eventually met a young woman who I wanted to marry. And uh, when I asked her father, you know, is it, you know, I'd like to marry your daughter. Can I have your blessing or whatever? He kind of sat me down and did like a mafioso style, like made me an offer I couldn't (laughs) refuse, which was essentially uh, he owned an independent insurance agency. And he basically said, I think because he didn't want his daughter to be married to a bum. um, He said, hey, will you come? I would like you to come work at the agency. And so basically, I became an insurance agent as the dowry for my wife's my well, she's my ex-wife now, but my my wife's hand in marriage basically was the was the deal, and um, and I was I was terrible at it, terrible. I just <laughs> I just struggled, and um, I just I couldn't. One, I didn't at the time understand the value of the product that we were selling or what we were actually trying to do. I just thought we were selling stuff, you know. I didn't I didn't think through what insurance really meant. And and look, insurance is not a sexy product. Most people hate it. Most people, you know, kind of it's, it's synonymous with hucksterism and, you know, just kind of the worst qualities, the worst type of qualities that people have uh, associate with, with big business and all that. But when you really get the core of what insurance is, and we can talk about this if anyone is actually, if you're interested at all, I don't want to make this about insurance if it doesn't have to be, but um, I had no idea how to sell the value of the product. So I was terrible at it. And after about 18 months, my father-in-law sat me down and said, um, he basically tried to fire me. And I quite literally <laughs> got down on my knees in the office. I was on my knees in the office. And I basically just said, I will do whatever needs to be done 
to not have you fire me right now. And uh, he agreed and he, he agreed to give me more time, but I had to do something different. I, I had been doing it the traditional way. And that's where I kind of found digital media. This was 2008, 2009. The internet was still considered a fad by some people, especially in the insurance industry. So I just started adopting basic principles in other industries and applying them to insurance and things, everything started to change for me because I was way out ahead of my competition on LinkedIn, on blogging, SEO. Uh, there was a time when um, this small independent insurance agency in upstate New York was the most trafficked YouTube channel in all of, in, in all of insurance. Um, and uh, there's a lot there, but I did that for eight years and essentially, um, the, they came back to me, her family came back to me and said, you know, we love you, but your name will never be on the box. You'll, you'll never, your, your last name is different than ours. So you'll never, is never be anything more than a producer here. And that, you know, I was in my early thirties and that was just an unacceptable answer. I just had too much entrepreneurialism, even though I don't know that I could have uh, classified it that way at the time. Um, I just couldn't accept that. So I took a series of other jobs um, in executive positions. I was a CMO uh, for two different national technology companies in the insurance industry. I then was a CEO of a, of a fitness franchise and was summarily fired um, from all three of those positions. And in the, really when you, the core, the core of it was I was an entrepreneur. I, I wanted to be a leader. I had a vision for these companies and the stakeholders the equity owners of those companies didn't, that's not what they wanted. They wanted a bureaucrat. They wanted someone who'd come in and, you know, make 17 page decks to describe why we were, you know, adding a, 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 a new conference table to, you know, whatever. And I just, I didn't do that shit. I was like, I, I want to grow. I want to win. I want to develop people. And that's what I'm going to focus on. And I'm not going to do all this other nonsense. And, um, I just we got fired over and over and over again. <laughs> essentially, um, essentially, I found myself sitting in uh, at eight thirty every morning. I was working for this fitness franchise. We had six locations, and when I started, we had um, two thousand members. And in nine months, I took us from two thousand members to thirty two hundred members, and two more and two new locations that were just opening and cranking. So I think we're doing great, and uh, we were doing great. And I'm sitting there 8.30 in the morning on a Monday. And the best part about being being a CEO of a fitness franchise is you literally just show up in like Lulu gear every day. That's like your, <laughs> that's like your outfit, your, your uniform. You know what Man, I mean? It's awesome. That's healthcare. We just show up in scrubs. <laughs> right? Yeah. And you're in your part of your job is working out at noon with like the with the clients. You know what I mean? Like that's like what you did. So yeah, I was you know, I was loving life. I was home. I wasn't traveling. It was great. And um, and and the the, the founder came in, except he came in in a suit with his attorney and said, Hey, you've done a great job, but I want to be the CEO again. I was his biggest expense. That was long story short. I I'd done a great job. I'd grown his business. I gotten him way past profitability and I was his largest expense. And he just cut me. And I said, I, I can't put myself in this position again. I can't be beholden to some, someone's whim, someone's own personal self-interest uh, like, you know, I have a family, I have, you know, my own life that I have to live and I have to look out for myself. So, um, at eight 36 AM on October 6th of 2019, I was jobless walking through the parking lot of this, of the, of our headquarters. And, um, I decided that it was time to start my own company. That company was going to be an insurance agency that, that I had kind of mapped out in my mind with some differentiating core values from what you see in a traditional space. And uh, that was going to be my goal. And I started it seven days before the zombie apocalypse, uh, March 9th <laughs> of 2020. So uh, um, we're still here, which, you know, we survived the zombie apocalypse, uh, thankfully. But um, but uh, it was a it was a very interesting journey. Uh, I was yeah. 40, 40 years old when I became an entrepreneur. Wow. And that's that's a great story for anybody who's listening is doesn't matter what age you are, you can become an entrepreneur at any time in your life. Now, now you kind of alluded to it. Now, what is this current venture or business and what inspired you? You kind of kind of alluded to it again, yep. but what really inspired you to pursue this particular, you mentioned insurance. So one, what is it and what yep. inspired you to pursue this particular entrepreneurial endeavor? Yeah. So there's some realities. Uh, if you spend too much time in the insurance industry, you develop an arcane set of skills that do not apply <laughs> anywhere else. So, so kind of like, 
I didn't really have a whole lot of places to Man, go. Was one. So true. Um, two, I, I had spent so much time in the industry, both as a local, you know, seeing kind of what a local, small, independent, traditional agency could provide, what the what the best parts of that business were, what the parts that I thought were kind of holding it back. And then being that I was an executive for two different national technology companies in the insurance industry, I got to see the other side of the space, the, the entrepreneurs, the Silicon Valley startups, the, the tech, the fast moving. I got to see both, right? So uh, I, I wrote down a couple core ideas at, um, uh, to, to start this business. Um, I wrote down the term uh, human optimize. So what I felt was, a, was, a, was a, an issue in our space was there was really a dichotomy. Um, there, or uh, uh, sorry, uh, a polarization in our in our industry. You had people that thought the humans were the problem, and that tech, automation, AI, ML, all these things that was the future. We needed to get humans out of the transaction as much as possible. And then you had this very traditional side of the industry, which thought all that stuff was nonsense. None of it helped. All of it was just distraction. And that really, you know pounding the pavement, human to human, press the flesh, you know, shake hands, kiss babies. That was the best way to do it. And all, all my idea was I'm, I'm going to cherry pick the best ideas for both and put them together. So, so the, the kind of idea that I wrote down was let's assume if you're going, right. So, so in order to be a, a, a successful entrepreneur, you have to be solving a specific problem that you believe exists, right? That's kind of a core, core aspect of entrepreneurialism. So the, the, the major issue that I wanted to solve first was the service issue. So what that means is, let's say, let's say uh, the cost of service in the insurance industry is very high. It's, it, it costs a lot of money to service insurance. So let's say you, you have an issue, Gabriel, and you, you call my agency. In a traditional agency, you're going to get, the person's going to get you on the phone, try to figure out what your problem is as fast as possible. Say they have a 20-minute block of time to spend on your problem. Okay. They're going to try to spend the least amount of time on the phone with you as they can, because they know it's going to take 15 to 17 minutes to actually process whatever your problem is. So they're spending this tiny little amount of time on the phone with you, the customer, the, the, the person that actually matters, because all this data entry and this system and that's it and all it's not. Okay. So what I wanted to do was flip that on its head. I wanted to create technology, automation, self-service issues like that, so that my, my service people, my team could spend 17 minutes on the phone. Gabriel, what's going on? How, why is this a problem? How do we make sure it doesn't happen again? What other problems may you have? You know, like, let's really get to know you as a customer, uh, make sure that you're properly serviced, that you're happy with what's going on, that you feel like you have uh, trust, respect, knowledge um, that you need to continue to interact with us. And then we have all the, we have everything baked in in the background from a technology perspective. Then it only takes three minutes to do that transaction. So to me, that's what I call human optimized. Put the humans in the positions where they add the most value. Remove them from the places where they do not add value. So that was core value number one. Core value core value number two was um, what we call a no ceiling insurance career. I never wanted because your last name is Flores and mine is Hanley that you couldn't make all your wildest dreams come true in my business. That someday you couldn't have a partner track that allowed you to own an asset related mm, to your work yeah. here. You know, I, I never wanted your last name to impact your ability to, to build a true asset for your family with our company. So that's the second. And then the third was an idea of no customer left behind. In our industry, uh, it is incredibly difficult to make money on small business. Small business accounts, the main street, there's 30 million of them. It is incredibly difficult to be profitable as a business. As, as much as that might sound crazy to people listening, you pay $3,000 in insurance premium for your business. I'm making $300 before I pay any of my systems. I pay any of my people. I pay any of the bills. I'm making $300 in that account. Me. So like, I'm not making three grand. You pay 10, right? Basically, you make 10% commission. So like, you're, you have to write a tremendous number of those accounts. And then the service needs stack up on the back. So like, it's very difficult. So what happens is, so what happens is that small businesses get shit on, basically. They get crap service. They get these, you know, automation tools that don't really help them, or they just get shoved through a system, or they get treated like a number. 
And what they get is very poor service, very poor understanding of the product they're purchasing. And, um, and, and that is, I wanted to make sure that these small businesses, the core of our country, what makes our country such a great place, the, the, the ability to own property and to own an asset and to start a business that can't be taken from you, insurance protects that. We're, we're in the sustainability business. That's what we do. Insurance is, is a sustainability product. And um, I wanted to make sure that you, Gabriel Flores, who owns this small business, that you were able to have the same level of service, the same level of access to products that someone who runs an enterprise level company with you know thousands of employees gets. And those three core ideas set the bedrock for Rogue. And that's what we've built upon to this day. I love it. Now, why would you say, you know, what, what, why is it important to not only serve your employees, but also serve the customers? Why, in your opinion, why is that so important? Yeah. Uh, cu- uh, employees are always more important than customers. There's 30 million customers for me in the world. 30, but I only, but I have 20 employees. We, well, if you count our, our virtual assistants, we're at 25. And um, those people, if those people aren't happy, if, they're, if they don't have find meaning and purpose in their job, if they don't like showing up, then they, it doesn't matter how hard we work to create a great product. It doesn't matter how good our sales process is, how good our marketing is. They're not going to do a good job for our customers. So your people have to be happy first. You can solve so many customer problems, so many product problems with great people in your company who feel supported, who feel pushed. Now, granted, uh, you know, and I, and I don't want to give away, you know, some of my politics or whatever, but like, I do not believe in the safe space bureaucratic mentality that we have developed today in our corporate culture. I think that a lot of it is not nonsense that we are, we, I do believe in a meritocracy. I do believe that people need to be pushed. I do believe that people need to be held accountable, but at the same time, we have to treat them like humans. We have to give them a place where they can feel safe or they can feel like they can push back. Right. What, what I find is in, in most of the bureaucratic organizations that I've worked in is they they confuse being able to share your opinion with your opinion being good and mattering, right? So those are two different things. You, if you work for me, you can share your opinion with me and there is no repercussions. You can say we're doing this wrong or I don't appreciate this or you said this this way and I didn't like it. That's great. You can say all those things. I don't have to agree with you. Correct. That's the difference. And unfortunately, I think what a lot, how a lot of people as leaders get caught up in is they feel like just because their employees say something that they have to take action on that thing. And that is not the case, in my opinion. It's you should be able to say whatever you want without, re- that, that's, that's the beauty of America is you can. You can share with me. I want to hear it. I just don't have to agree with you. And um, so we are like a merit-based organization. We hire a lot of uh, single moms or moms with young kids because our industry tends to throw them away because their schedules are less flexible. So we are fully remote, work from home. And uh, I have this just incredible team. Uh, and like I said, we, we bring on a lot of um, uh, single moms and moms with young kids because we have the flexibility in our business to, that their lifestyle needs. And we're getting rock stars that other agencies and insurance organizations have thrown away because they can't work a traditional 8.30 to 4.30, you know, punch the clock kind of thing. We hire adults and we treat people like adults. If you got to steal an hour in the morning because your kid's throwing up, Go deal with your kid, take care of your kid, get that squared away, get them safe, get them happy so that you, when you do show up at 930, you're ready to rock. Your mental is here and you're with us, right? Where other places you're scrambling, you're running around. Now the rest of the day, you're thinking about this sick kid that you didn't really get to take care of and you're feeling bad as a parent or you don't really know where they're at. So like, so it's a, it's a give and take. I expect that on the back end. I expect you to get me that, that hour back somewhere, right? But I'm going to treat you like an adult and assume that you're going to get it back. I'm not going to have it in some system where I'm like, you owe me an hour or whatever. Nah, if, if you can't trust the person to get you that hour back, get rid of them. That's, that's yeah, what it is. I'd agree. And I think, I think that's one thing that a lot of people can take away is, you know, having autonomy in your role of uh, being empowered, feeling like the empowerment to make the right decisions, but also to your point, being held accountable for those decisions. I, you know, I work in healthcare and there's so many times where, my words can truly affect massive relationships, right? Um, huge relationships and can swing in various ways in the healthcare industry. And so 
my relationships with others is very important. I have the autonomy to make those decisions and I have the empowerment. However, if I make the wrong decision, if I say the wrong thing, I should be expecting to kind of get that call to the office and, hey, what what exactly was this? Now, let's cut, kind of bring it back to the business area. What, you know, you're in the, you're in the insurance world. Let's talk about the benefits of utilizing insurance as a small business owner. Yeah. So, so um, we talk about insurance, everyone talks about insurance as protection. And, and, and if you went and checked out our website, you'd see we use that word too. But to me, insurance doesn't protect you. You know what I mean? Like if your pipe bursts, we're not there to like, grab it and, you know, fix the pipe. I mean, eventually someone's going to come. Insurance is about sustainability. So what we're trying to do is create a series of financial levers that allow you to sustain your business when something really bad happens. That's what, that's what insurance is. It, um, our economy runs, whether we like it or not, on insurance. If insurance didn't exist, the bu- look outside your window. The buildings you see, they would not exist if there wasn't insurance. The bank wouldn't give you a loan. Uh, you wouldn't have credit, you people wouldn't buy stuff that the entire, you know, all these things are levered on the back of insurance that if something really bad happens, there is this product which comes in and creates sustainability. So when we think about insurance, I try not to get people to think about protection. That's, that's, that's a, that's the wrong way of thinking about it. It's, do you want, if you have a really bad day, do you want your business to continue to exist? The simple yes or no. If the answer is no, then Screw around with insurance. Don't really take it seriously. Buy the cheapest thing. Do it, right? If what you're saying is the hard work, the effort, the time, all the stress, all the anxiety, all the hours, if those are meaningful to you and you would like to keep that business going if you have a bad day, then an hour a year of thoughtfulness to your insurance with a, with a professional that you trust will, will make sure that that is as close to reality as possible. And so what do I mean by bad days? Well, if you own a shop, right? You own a shop. Someone drops a bottle of water on the ground, slips and falls in your shop and breaks their head, right? We have an aging population. Um, My dad just had hip surgery last year, right? Because he, well, he did it because he plays too much golf. But, uh, (laughs) you know, I actually had an aunt who slipped and fell, broke her hip, had to have her hip replaced, right? So like these things happen all the time. And we can say it's not going to happen to us. We can say, you know, those are all things, but those are excuses. It's not reality. How about, let me give you an example of, um, and maybe you can kind of tell me how insurance could kind of help. Uh, so obviously Portland, Oregon, we, we have a lot of a transients in our community. Uh, this is not, this is not saying a bad thing. These are individuals that are kind of down on our luck right now. We're trying to help them out. Now, with that said, we do have individuals in our community that also, unfortunately just love destruction. Yep. Right. Um, and fortunately, our small business community has been hit hard by a lot of theft and break ins and, and, and vandalism. Yeah. How how and how does insurance kind of help that that community? So let's say you have a storefront and someone's high on fentanyl, grabs a rock and throws it through your front window. Replaced. Let's say that person decides to then take a lighter, light a piece, a newspaper on fire and throw it in the front window after they throw the the rock through that fire burns down your business. That's insurance. Um, let's say, uh, let's say you, uh, you're one of those people comes in, right? So one of the things that's happening across the country right now is, um, vagrants or whatever are, um, they're, they're, they're doing, there's a lot of insurance scams that are happening. So a way to get money because there's a lot of unscrupulous ambulance chasing lawyers, especially in, and again, this is not a political statement, it's just truth, in more liberal states who allow for large scale judgments from a liability standpoint, right? You have you have these individuals going into stores and faking slip and falls or actually hurting themselves and then going to attorneys and having them come after store owners as a way to go after the insurance money. What they think is, I'm sure this business has insurance. I'm going to come after them. If you don't have insurance and they file the claim, guess what? You're still on the hook. Um, they can come after your business. Uh, let's say two people get into a brawl in your business, right? We, you see scenes from all over the country, and, and this is something that's happening. You have, you have a brawl in your business between people, right? So it doesn't matter who it is. It could be, you know, take, take, uh, take vagrants or, or immigrants or whatever out of the question. It could just be two drunk idiots walk into your store and get into a fight. They can sue you 
because it happened in your building. You are responsible as a business owner, whether you rent or not, for everything that happens in that business. Now, the physical damage stuff is fairly straightforward. Um, uh, there are only certain scenarios where your state or town can actually kind of screw you if they um, there are there are some types of policies that will uh, that will exclude riot. There are some that will exclude states of emergency. So if they declare something a state of emergency, that can kind of hose you up a little bit. Sometimes those are obscure, but for the most part, physical damage is going to be covered most of the time. Um, and then the liability one is where you really get hit. So liability is uh, you sell a product and someone says it hurt them or was dis uh, uh, doesn't function properly. Uh, someone gets hurt on your property. Uh, there's violence on your property. Um, say you have to defend yourself, right? You have to, def let's say you have to actually defend yourself. You're a shop owner. Someone attacks you. You have to defend yourself. <laughs> Unfortunately, in a lot of states, the person who initially attacked you can then sue you. And in that case, insurance is going to be what defends you. And um, people don't realize that uh, that's in most insurance policies, that's first dollar defense, which means that you are not going to have to pay for that legal work out of pocket. That insurance company is going to pay every dollar from dollar one to defend you up to your up to your liability limit. Now, the other thing that I'd tell you what's happening um, uh, outside of the scenario that you described is there is a lot of um, interpersonal lawsuits happening. And what I mean by that is uh, sexual harassment, discrimination. Um, those are really big ones. Um, where business owners can get hung up is that uh, the laws are not meant to protect the businesses. They're meant to protect the individuals. So let's say you interview three white people. Uh, someone who isn't white can sue you because you interviewed for a position and did not interview someone of, of that wasn't white. You could just be like, I didn't even realize. I just interviewed three people. The third person was great. I hired him. I wasn't even thinking about it, right? Um, that In some states, that's illegal. You can't not do that. And it doesn't matter that you're a small business. It doesn't matter that you don't have the time. It doesn't matter that you didn't know the law, that you're you're going to get sued for that. And I mean, look at the NFL, right? They have the Rooney rule uh, that yeah. was created. And, you know, and I think, you know, one of the things you mentioned too, uh, there, this piece was you're, you're talking about also individuals that are kind of strategically going out there and, and trying to find reasons to yep. create a uh, issue. A, a great example, a former guest, a um, large company, I'm going to exclude the name, but they had their website. They were actually, and this is starting to become um, a trend. So small business owners, please take heed of this warning. Uh, your website even is becoming targeted if it is not in compliance with ADA rules. Now, again, ADA, you're thinking like wheelchair access into a building, but you also need to have the capabilities for individuals that maybe have hearing impairment or reading impairment to access your website. And if not, people are now targeting those websites and coming at them and suing them for not being ADA accessible. And so, yeah. um, again, it's this is not to say this is any uh, I think people are just taking advantage of opportunities, yeah. just like we saw during the pandemic and then the PPL loan or the PP loans, right? And then people mm -hmm. really took advantage of those opportunities. There are people, unfortunately, that are out there that are going to try to take advantage of small businesses or individuals in general, right? Yeah. Um, insurance is just kind of a, it's really nice to have it when you need it. Sure, I understand sometimes it probably sucks to have to pay for it because sometimes you're like, man, I don't need it. Like, but hey, I get glasses every year because I pay for insurance. Now, yeah. now, Ryan, how how can businesses use insurance strategically to gain a competitive edge and out, outlast their rivals? Yeah. So to me, um, I think of I think of insurance as the foundation upon which you grow your business, right? You want to hire new people, you want to expand and grow. Like I said, you're gonna need EPLI because if anyone knows. You have humans who work for you. They're going to bump into each other. They're going to piss each other off. Someone's going to say the wrong thing. You're going to have problems. Uh, the larger you get, the more apt you become a target from a cyber attack, right? So if you want to grow and grow without major obstacles, creating financial instability, you have to have these products in place. They're just, they, they are the foundation upon which you grow your business. Um, business owners policy, workers comp policy, commercial auto policy. There are a lot of people driving around doing commercial work in their personal vehicle and don't realize that if they get into an accident doing a commercial job, 
with a personal auto policy, your personal auto carrier 100% has every right to deny that claim. And they're going to go, insurance is the worst, but, but you don't, you did not do your job. Your job was to adequately and accurately describe the usage of that vehicle, which was commercial purposes. You tried to save a few bucks by having a personal auto policy. And that's the nature of the deal. So like there are, it's, it's not, insurance is tough because again, you're getting a promise. You're paying all this money for what? We don't even get paper documents anymore, right? We just get an email that says, hey, you have coverage now. And that's a, that's a, it's a difficult thing for people to wrap their, their head around that value. But I have seen over and over again, I'll give you an an example. I had a, um, I have a a furniture store, a large furniture chain. That's a client of ours. And they got a, uh, my, my client, the owner of that business got an email from one of his larger customers who frequently buys uh, furniture from him. Hey man, what's this, uh, what's this $50,000 we spent on furniture? So my customer goes into, my client goes into his database and he said, we don't have a, we didn't charge you $50,000 for anything. We didn't, we didn't, we don't have a transaction on the record. So uh, a hacker spoofed uh, the email address of my client, sent an invoice to this, to his customer for 50,000 bucks. The guy saw it, forwarded it on to his account executive or whatever. She paid the bill. Didn't even think anything of it. Three months later, they're going through their finances, you know, going through the records and they're, they're wondering exactly what they got for this. Come to find out, that's a cyber liability claim. That's that's that he that guy got that guy got uh um it's social engineering, but yeah, he they got they got spoofed. And that my client didn't do anything. And he, but he's responsible because yeah. the person who spoofed him used his name and a version of his brand in the email address. It was like, you know, name underscore, name underscore, whatever to get to it. And the guy just didn't, you know, he's just moving fast as we all do. And, and here he got, he got took for 50 grand and the cyber policy had to pay. So yeah. now 50 grand to him, thankfully, even if he did have to pay it out of pocket, wouldn't have like killed his business. But I'll tell you four years ago, when he first started that 50 grand would have been yeah. an enormous yeah. hit on him. I mean, I mean, possibly even like a game changing hit for him. If, you know, today he's big enough, but he didn't have to pay it. He had cyber insurance. So like, that's the kind of thing where like, you're just going about your day. You didn't do anything wrong. You didn't, you didn't make any mistakes. You didn't even click on a link. This, they just used your likeness to, to, to uh, socially engineer this other business, got $50,000 on them and you're responsible. So it's like, these are the kind of things that, again, it's sustainability. It's how important is your business to you long-term? It is, in my opinion, you don't need every insurance policy that exists day one. I think if you work with a good broker, and this is something that we try to do, and I try to train my people on is, we don't want to be hucksters. We're not trying to sell and maximize everybody's account to the max number of policies they could possibly buy every time, right? We want you want to try to work with someone who's going to understand your current situation. You you don't need a commercial auto policy if you're not using your vehicle for commercial auto. You don't need uh, you may not need certain endorsements on your policy if those things aren't appropriate. When they are, you can add them. But, you know, so be smart about what you buy. You don't need to get, I'm not trying to scare anybody into go out and buy every policy that exists. That, that might impact your cash flow and you might, that might hurt your business. But by, by working with someone, having honest conversations, you know, a lot of times small business owners rely or bend the truth to their insurance agent because they feel like it's going to save them on premium. That is, if you have to do that with your insurance agent, that is not the right insurance agent to work with. Find someone who you can have an honest conversation with who isn't going to push products down your throat that you don't need but will help you strategically build a portfolio of products that matches the risks that you actually have. And you will, you'll find them when these really terrible things happen and hopefully they never do, but if they do that, you get a check from the insurance company. Cause here's what I do know. It's not the 1700s anymore. If something bad happens to your business, the town is not rallying around you to put your business back together. If your if your business burns down tomorrow and you don't have insurance, Sorry, it's a it's a story in the newspaper. People forget about it within a week, and you're sitting at home with no job and no business, and everyone's just like, "That's too bad." We're sorry. If you have the right insurance policy, a check comes in the mail two or three days later, and you're rebuilding your business already. And um, you know, I've just seen it too many times. I mean, that example I gave you about the furniture thing, 
that's one of a thousand examples yeah. I have of just all the crazy, wacky, stupid, you know, things you just could have never seen coming that happen. That could be bumps in the road. They could be just little nuisances or they could end your business if you're not properly protected. Now, what would you say? Cause you mentioned, you know, trying to avoid working with some insurance companies if you're trying to negotiate prices. Yeah. One, what questions should small business owners, or entrepreneurs be asking insurance companies? And then yeah. two, what are some of the red flags? If an insurance company says this, that might be a red flag. Yeah, that's a good question. So the first thing I'm going to tell you is, and everyone's going to think this is a sales pitch. It's not because I have 36,000 independent insurance agency competitors, I guess you could say out in the marketplace. So you do not need to work with us. What I'm saying is if you go direct, you're the insurance agent. A lot of small business owners being entrepreneurial, being self-starters, they think if they go online or they go direct to a company that they're just, they're making the smart decision. I'm cutting out the broker. I'm not going to pay them a fee. Well, one, understand that you are, you are not paying less by going direct. That's just not the case. Two, um, you become the insurance agent. So let's say I give you bad advice. I say, you know what, Gabriel, you know what? In Oregon, workers comp's kind of like a secondary thing. You don't really need that, man. You're good. You're fine. And someone gets hurt and you get sued. That's an errors and omissions claim on my insurance policy that I have. It's my, I'm, a, I'm a professional, just like a financial advisor, just like a lawyer, just like a doctor, just like a dentist. I have errors and omissions insurance, right? So if I give you inappropriate, bad, illegal, advice, I, that comes back at me. So now you're, you're by working with a broker, you are protected in, you have an extra layer of protection in that you can come back after me if I don't do my job correctly, uh, especially if I don't do my job correctly intentionally. So you become the broker if you go direct. So if something bad happens, it's not the insurance carrier's fault. They're selling a product. They're a manufacturer. They create the t-shirt. You're the one that's wearing the t-shirt, right? That's the way to think about it. The insurance carriers are manufacturers. They are manufacturing a product. They are not the ones who are supposed to be giving the, the advice. Okay, that's one. Do not go direct. Avoid going direct if you can. Um, and if you have Geico and you're listening to this, you should slap yourself in the face and get rid of that company immediately because <laughs> you are making a very bad decision. Um, they have 11 exclusions that no other insurance carrier in the country has that they don't talk about. And that's how their prices are less. So everyone who thinks they're being smart, it's, you're not. Uh, that being said, okay, so let's let's talk about this. So, so don't go direct. Okay, so you, you find a broker. First, use the smell test. Do you think you can trust them? Do they seem like a trustworthy person? Do they seem like they have their best interest in mind? Or are they just trying to blow through your account, sell you some stuff and move on, right? So use the smell test. You, you know, use your intuition. If that makes sense, then start to ask them real questions. Like, what's your philosophy on protecting my business? You know, how do we make sure that I have the right coverage without having too much coverage, right? You know, I think if you're just shopping for the cheapest thing, you're going to put yourself into in a tough place, but it's very appropriate to ask them, how do you weigh the, the, the coverage you think is the best for me versus my needs from a price perspective, right? Like ask them these questions and see what they say. Everybody's going to have a slightly different answer, but how they answer is going to give you insights into how they think, right? Because what you want is someone who's going to say, okay, there, I have three carriers I'm looking at. Uh, there's maybe three different prices, um, three different levels of coverage or types of coverage or, or claim situations, right? So like, uh, I'll give you a good example. I write a lot of business with the Hartford for small business. I like the Hartford a lot. Pricing is very consistent. Product is very robust. Claims handling is very consistent. Are they the cheapest? Sometimes, not always, maybe less than 50% of the time are they the cheapest. Um, but what I know is when one of my customers has an issue with the Hartford, it's going to get taken care of. They're going to solve the problem. They're going to figure out what it is. And to the best of their ability, they're going to get that customer back to whole. So if I have the Hartford and say, maybe I'm not going to name so negatively, but another company that maybe is even a hundred or 200 bucks less, if we're talking small business, maybe sometimes thousands less, if we're talking larger businesses, but I know that when they have a bad day, it's going to be a pain in the butt, right? It's they're going to, they're going to haggle them. They're going to nickel and dime them. They're going to, maybe they have some coverages that aren't in there that are kind of important. I'm not going to present that to them. And I'm going to tell my customers, that's my philosophy is like, I would rather you go do business with someone else than me put you into a product 
that is knowingly going to not help you in your moment of need. And, I, and since there's 30 million small businesses, I'm okay with you choosing someone else. It doesn't mean I'm going to put you in the most expensive thing. And trust me, we don't make enough on a percentage basis for these differences in premium to mean anything to me, like from an income perspective, it is strictly that I want to be able to look my customers in the face. And, and there's many agents, not just me. So, so what I'm saying is I'm trying to embody what I would look for in an agent, not, right. not necessarily us. Uh, obviously happy to work with anybody, but there's plenty of agents that think the same way. But like find someone who, who, who would feel, who would be regretful or disappointed in themselves if they didn't properly take care of you. And then just ask them these questions. I think that um, you can you can you can smell when someone is doing it for the wrong reasons. You'll 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 be able to hear it. You'll be able to smell it. So I think you know how do you marry that is a good one. How do you pick which company you offer us is a good one. Um, uh, you know how do I manage my budget versus all the coverages I should have. Uh, you know is do you have a way of creating a plan for me as I grow those kind of things. And I think you'll get a good feel for what they're all about. Yeah. And, you know, this is a good point, not only for, you know, when you're looking at insurance brokers, but also as entrepreneurs, your differentiator sometimes is your customer service. Yeah. You know, if you you can schedule a dinner at a five-star restaurant at 530, but if they don't sit me down until six o'clock, I don't care how good the food is. The service wasn't there. Yeah. Right. Um, I, when I go to Starbucks and I ask for my, you know, grande hazelnut latte with whip i want it to be correct all the time not sometimes not usually but always right and that's kind of the same thing with customer services we kind of want things to be done the same way pretty consistently to your point ryan we don't want to be nickel and dime every time we we call someone now um for you know that was some great advice i think for the for the listeners and things to kind of think about and, and questions to ask for them uh, and you also mentioned, hey, you'd, you'd be happy to work with some of these folks. So how do they get in contact with you? If they are interested in learning more, well, actually first, before I ask that, yeah. what's what's uh, what's the five-year plan for Rogue Risk? What, where do you see yourself in five years? Yeah, so we are we are continuing to grow and expand. Um, we work with uh, both individual companies. We also, uh, a division of our company that we're continuing to grow is actually um, our partnership division. So companies that have, uh, say client sets. Um, one of them is uh, we have a we have a very large um, trucking transponder company, and what what we've done is partner with them, and we've created essentially a, a custom program for their customers, where the the trucking clients who work with them from a transponder perspective, they now will refer them over to us and know that they're getting great service, that it is dedicated, that the product set is, was approved by the transponder company, so they know what products we're offering. And now they know their com their customers are being taken care of. So we do a lot of that too. Um, uh, so that's like a big part of our, but I'd say the core is getting, I want, I want to give people who are looking to have a life. Like I, I grew up poor as shit. I did. Uh, people used, my friends used to refer to my house, a crack house. People used to say you could keep your doors open in our town because the criminals live there. They didn't steal from there. Right. It was 900 people. We were in the middle of nowhere in the woods insurance and, 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 and entrepreneurialism mindset and the insurance industry has given me a life I could have never expected in a life that I could have never imagined that my kids have. I'm very blessed, very thankful, a lot of hard work, but, but, but this is an amazing career, amazing industry. It's challenging. It's thoughtful. Yes. People will hate you, but, but you know, you're doing, you know, you're doing something close to God's work and trying to create these, you know, pe protect people's lives and businesses. I like to believe. And, um, I want to give as many people who are who are as willing to put in the work the opportunity to experience this career and change their life. It doesn't matter. You don't, you know, you don't need anything more than a high school diploma to work for Rogue Risk. We are not, we don't hold you to some crazy standard. If you're hardworking, if you're willing to come in and be part of our team and buy into our process and and work hard for our, for the for the people that that choose to work with us, um, there's a lot of money to be made. There's a, there's a wonderful career flexibility. You can have a life, you can have a family. And that's the part of the business that I really want to grow. The, the clients will always come, right? And we'll, but I want to give humans an opportunity to, to change the course of their life if that's what they want. And, and selling insurance products, um, 
it's particularly property casualty insurance products. It, it is a wonderful career. It's challenging. It's exciting. There's big deals. There's small deals. You get to work with all, learn about all these amazing people. And especially on the commercial line side, you get to learn about all these businesses. And then the variety of businesses that exist in the United States is insane. And, and these people are crazy. I mean, you talk to entrepreneurs all day, right? The podcast, that's what we do all day. We're talking to these wacky people. One guy was, you know, we, we just wrote a, a guy that he, he scrapes barnacles off the bottoms of boats off the coast oh, of yeah. South Carolina. And he's talking about how he puts them in, he racks them and all the things he does. And like, I don't know. I mean, it's just wild to hear about this guy's business and what he does and how he does. It. And he loves it. Right. And he makes, you know, makes good money. And um, so that's, that's really want to, I want to get this process dialed in and start to put not just, you know, today we have 12 producers. I'd like to have dozens, if not hundreds of producers someday coming through and, and experiencing what this career has to offer and hopefully giving them uh, a, similar, um, a similar change in dynamic of lifestyle that I've experienced over the 42 years of my life. So that's really, that's really my focus as the leader of the company. Um, obviously, we're always trying to expand into other areas, but uh, giving, giving our people that, that experience and that ability and that career path is, is my big mission. I love it. Now, for the folks, again, at home, if they're interested in connecting with you, yeah. How do they find you? What's your website, social media location? Yeah. Awesome. Uh, so one, I just, I just appreciate the opportunity, man. I love talking about this stuff and love talking about entrepreneurism. So uh, if you're, if you're interested in our company, you go to just rogue risk, uh, uh, R O G U E R I S K.com. You can check us out. Actually uh, we just launched earlier this week, the first ever commercial insurance search engine. So we're using um, we've uh, partnered with an AI assist company and um, we basically took, we have, we have, uh, thousands of pieces of content because education, obviously I like to talk education is a big part of what we do at Rogue. So we have all these YouTube videos, all this, and we, we've uh, indexed it all. And now you can ask it questions and get all your answers right there. It's the first ever kind of AI assisted search engine and commercial insurance. So you can check that out. If, even if you don't work with us, even if you use it to hold your agent um, uh, uh, like accountable to what they say, use it. It's yours. It's free. You can go out and check it out. Happy to do that. If you're interested in what I'm doing, I'll give you two places. Um, uh, I create and communicate a lot on Instagram. I'm Ryan underscore Hanley, H-A-N-L-E-Y, Ryan underscore Hanley on Instagram. And I share all the entrepreneurial ideas, concepts, things I've learned. Uh, the, my journey has been crazy. And um, I try to share those ideas there. And uh, if you like this kind of stuff, um, I write about it at Finding Peak. Uh, F I N D I N G P E A K dot com. Um, you can check that out. And um, yeah, just appreciate the hell out of you, man. This has been super fun and uh, wish you nothing but the best and same to your audience. Love it. And love it. And folks, again, so if you did not write all that information down, this is a great time to plug the Shades of Entrepreneurship newsletter. All this information will be on the newsletter the week before the episode airs, the week the episode airs, and the week after the episode airs. So Ryan's uh, information will be on the newsletter for three weeks straight. So again, to subscribe to that, please visit the shadesofe.com. Ryan, thank you again so much uh, for coming on the show. I really do appreciate it. I think you brought a lot of value to the listeners, especially in questions to ask and things to avoid when uh, looking at small businesses. So I really do appreciate your time. For those folks listening at home, again, please subscribe to uh, theshadesofee.com. You can also visit us at The Shades of E on Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn and TikTok. Without that, thank you and have a great night. Thank you for tuning in to The Shades of Entrepreneurship. For more information, please follow The Shades of E on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or visit theshadesofee.com. 